I used to sell heating and air conditioning units in Michigan during college. We got a call from a guy who needed a new furnace for his very old home. I went over to give him a quote for an installation, and we got to talking about his house and the history. He told me that during the slave days, his home was part of the Underground Railroad. It had a hidden tunnel that led down to the train station about 500 yards away. It really piqued my interest when he made reference to the spirits that lived with him. He told me about a female ghost that was really fascinated by electricity. He said she would randomly turn the lights on and off. As I was going over the details of the quote and his payment options, the light directly behind me went on by itself. Then the light across the room went on, then the one in the kitchen and the one in the hallway. I got very quiet and sank back in my chair. Then the guy raised his voice a little and said, Okay, that's enough for today, dear. We can do this again tomorrow. And all the lights went back off by themselves. To this day, I don't know if the guy was just having a little fun at my expense, or if that was for real. But on a side note, I did make the sale, and the guy that I sent over to do the installation said that there was nothing wrong with the electricity in the house. So, who knows? In the late 1970s, my uncle was studying medicine at the University of Chicago. After a morning class, he decided he would hitchhike back to his Lincoln Park apartment instead of taking a bus or a taxi. A man stopped and offered my uncle a ride. He looked like a normal guy and seemed very friendly, so my uncle got in the car and they started toward Lakeshore Drive. However, once they got there, the man drove south on Lakeshore instead of north towards Lincoln Park. My uncle told the man he was going the wrong way and told him to turn around and head north. The man looked at my uncle, put his hand on his knee and said, No, son, you're coming with me. And he had an evil smile on his face. My uncle froze, but when they hit traffic near the south shore, he quickly unlocked the passenger door and got out and ran away without looking back. The following year, my uncle saw a news report that made his blood run cold. There on the TV screen was the man that had picked him up while hitchhiking that day. He had been arrested on the suspicion of rape and murder of over 20 young men and boys. That man was John Wayne Gacy. It came out later that Gacy told the police that he began removing the inside door handle from the passenger side of the car to prevent the men he picked up from escaping, like my uncle had. This past winter, I hiked on one of the highest peaks of the Andirondacks with a friend of mine. We camped out overnight, and everything was fine, until we left. I had a great night's sleep and woke up early to hike back to the parking area. On the way back down the trail, my friend and I noticed something very strange. About a mile into our walking down, I stopped and saw that my full name, first, middle, and last, was drawn in the snow on the side of the footpath. I didn't do it, and neither did my friend. It was snowing a bit throughout the night, and if it was drawn the day before, the snow would have been covering it up, but it was fresh. We got a bit freaked out and decided to hustle it back to the car so we could get out of there. When we finally got back to the parking area, I went to sign myself out of the guest registry book. As I turned the page to where I signed in, I saw that someone had scribbled out all of my information to the point where you couldn't even read it anymore. I looked in the book, and no one else had signed in other than my friend and me for the past three days. I will not be going back there. Back in the 1980s, my father had a summer job at Yellowstone National Park. He and his friend Mark hiked to the top of one of the mountains and set up a tent inside of an Indian pit, a man-made hole dug out by Native Americans hundreds of years ago. These Indian pits were used by young braves. They lived in them during their vision quest, a time when braves would seek out their spirit guides. 
Late that night, my dad woke up and needed to relieve himself. He crawled out of the pit and walked a respectable distance from the tent to do his business. But he was groggy and not paying attention to where he was going. Suddenly, he felt a hand on his shoulder pulling him backwards. Dad called out, Hey, Mark, what are you doing? He spun around, but no one was there. He shined his flashlight on the ground and saw that if he had kept walking, in the next couple of steps, he would have walked off a steep cliff and gone either to his death or been hurt very badly. He did his business and hurried back to the tent. The next morning, his friend said to him, I know this sounds crazy, but I woke up in the middle of the night, and I swear to you, there was an Indian man standing outside our tent. Whatever really happened that night, whoever it was, thanks to him, my dad is alive. About five years ago, I lived downtown in a major city in the U.S. I've always been a night person, so I would often find myself bored after my roommate went to sleep. To pass the time and not wake him up, I used to go for long walks and spend the time thinking. I walked alone at night many times and never once had reason to feel afraid. I used to joke with my roommate saying that even the drug dealers in this town were polite. But all that changed one evening. It was somewhere between 1 and 2 in the morning, and I was walking near a park about 2 miles from my apartment. It was a quiet night and there was almost no traffic at all. The park was completely empty, and I turned down a dark street intending to loop back to my apartment when I first noticed him. At the far end of the street, on my side, was the silhouette of a man, dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz. After each move, he stepped forward with a long stride, so I guess you could say he was dance-walking, and headed straight for me. Figuring that he was probably drunk, I stepped into the road to give him the whole sidewalk to pass me by. The closer he got, the more I realized how gracefully he was moving. He was very tall, lanky, and wearing an old suit. As he danced closer, I could make out his face. His eyes were open wide and had a wild look about them. His head was tilted back slightly, and he was staring up at the sky. His mouth was formed in a painfully wide cartoon-like smile. Between the eyes and the smile, I decided to cross the street before he danced any closer. I took my eyes off him for just a second to cross the empty street. As I got to the other side, I glanced back and stopped dead in my tracks. He had stopped dancing and was standing with one foot on the curb and the other in the street, perfectly parallel to me. He was facing me, but he was still looking skyward with that wide smile on his face. I was completely and utterly unnerved by this. I started walking again, but kept my eye on the man. He didn't move. Once I had walked about half a block further, I turned away from him for just a moment to watch the sidewalk in front of me so I wouldn't fall. There was no one around at all. Still unnerved, I looked back to where he had just been standing a moment before, only to find him gone. For a brief moment I felt relieved, until I saw him again. He had crossed the street to my side and was now slightly crouching down facing me, as if he were ready to pounce. I had looked away from him for no more than ten seconds, so it was clear that he could move fast. I was so shocked I stood there for some time just staring at him. Then he started to move towards me again. But this time, instead of dance walking, he took giant exaggerated tiptoe steps, as if he were a cartoon character sneaking up on someone. Except he was moving very, very quickly. I'd like to say that at that point I ran away or used pepper spray or maybe called 911 on my cell phone, anything at all, but I didn't. I just stood there completely frozen as this smiling man crept towards me. Then he stopped again, about a car length away from me, still smiling, still looking up at the sky. When I finally found my voice, I said the first thing that came to mind. What I meant to do was yell, 
What the hell do you want? In an angry, commanding tone. But what came out was a whispered, Why are you doing this? Hearing the fear in my own voice only frightened me more. But he had no reaction at all. He just stood there, smiling. Then, after what felt like forever, he turned around, very slowly, and started dance-walking away, just like that. Not wanting to turn my back on him again, I stood there for quite a while watching him go, until he was so far away I could barely see him. I started to relax, until I realized something. He wasn't moving away anymore, nor was he dancing. To my utter horror, the distant shape of him was getting bigger and bigger. He was coming back my way. And this time, he was running. I ran too. I ran until I was off the dark road and back onto a better lit road with a bit of traffic. When I finally stopped and looked behind me, he was nowhere to be found. The rest of the way home I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see his grotesque smile. But it was never there. After that, I never went for another late-night walk alone. There was something about his face that haunted me. He didn't look drunk or high. He looked completely insane. And that's a very, very scary thing to see, especially when you're all alone at night on a dark street. I taught criminal justice classes at Glenville State Community College in West Virginia. I was responsible for the third floor of Lewis Bennett Hall, an old dormitory that had been converted to administration's offices on the first floor, IT on the second floor, and my satellite site for the National Corrections of Law Enforcement Training and Technology Center on the third. My floor held my office, three classrooms, a gym for physical training, and student lodging rooms. The first time I thought something was off about the place was the Saturday before I started. My wife and I had gone to set up my office and do some cleaning. We took our dog Zoe with us. As we worked, we noticed that Zoe was always right beside one of us, which was unusual. I went across the hall to get some cleaning supplies and Zoe came with me. She looked down towards the end of the hallway and began growling. I turned around, but I didn't see anything but her growls became louder and more aggressive. Suddenly, she began backing up and whimpering, and she peed on the floor. She never did that at home. I grabbed her and took her outside in case she needed to pee some more. She didn't want to go back inside, to the point where she actually bit me when I tried to carry her back in. So I secured her leash on a stair railing and went in to tell my wife what happened. When we were done cleaning, we got our stuff and left. But as we were driving away, Zoe jumped into the back seat and began barking like crazy at the building. Several months later, I was scheduled to give a presentation for some public safety first responders on a Saturday. The college was a pretty long drive from my house, so I decided to spend the night in the student dorm rooms in the building so I wouldn't have to worry about getting there on time the next day. When I woke up the next morning, I was alone in the building. I was getting ready to go to the auditorium and was drinking a cup of coffee. I had a bit of a cold and started coughing. When I was done, I heard someone doing an over-exaggerated fake coughing sound to mock me. Then I heard furniture being moved around pretty loudly. Thinking it was the IT tech who was there to set up the auditorium for me pulling a prank, I yelled out, Jackass! and left the building. I was waiting outside the auditorium when the tech guy came running up to me out of breath. I told him that I didn't care for his coughing joke, and I asked him what he had been moving around so loudly. He just stared at me, and finally said that he was sorry that he was late due to a flat tire, and that he hadn't been up to his floor yet. We called the campus police, thinking that someone had broken in. I explained what happened, and the officers checked out the building, but everything was secure and nothing was out of place on the second floor. Some time later, I was on the college's website. One of the things I saw was a page about the college being haunted. There was an interview with the vice president who said that when she was on the second floor working one weekend in my building, she heard someone call her name. 
Then she heard furniture being thrown around outside of her office. But when she looked, nothing was out of place. When I read this, I was stunned. I called the vice president and I asked her about the story. She said it was just one of the many hauntings in that building. If you go to their website, you may still be able to find the story. There's supposedly a murder victim that haunts the college. I always believed in the paranormal before, but experiencing it still makes quite an impact. I go to a large university, and last year, I'm convinced that I stayed in a haunted dormitory. Before this experience, I didn't know whether to believe in ghosts or not, but now, I'm a firm believer. From the beginning, my roommate and I noticed that odd things would happen to our door. It would fly open even when it was closed and locked. We chalked it up to it just being an old building. Then one day in October, I noticed a flyer in the library that was offering ghost tours for Halloween. This piqued my interest. I didn't know the school had any ghost stories associated with it. So I went home and did an internet search. I found out that three dormitories on campus were considered to be haunted, and one of them was mine. Apparently, a senior girl hung herself in one of the rooms on the eve of her graduation, and her ghost supposedly haunts the place. I found this interesting and told my roommate. As I was telling her the story and I got to the part about the hanging, our door flew open violently. I'm not exaggerating here. It banged against the wall so hard it left a mark, and there was no one in the hall. My roommate told me to stop talking about it because it was obviously upsetting the ghost, so we never discussed it again. A few months later, though, at 2 a.m. on a weeknight, I was awakened by someone running up and down the hallway banging on the walls. I figured it was just someone who was drunk, so I went back to sleep. About 30 minutes later, it happened again. At that point, I was annoyed and I opened the door to tell whoever it was to shut up. But to my surprise, the hallway was empty. I started seeing ghosts as a teen. It seems the house we bought was still occupied by the former owner who died in it, and he stuck around to look after the place. He had a knack for taking things of mine for a week or two, then returning them clear on the other end of the house from where they were. One night I heard knocking on my second floor bedroom window, but when I got up to look outside, no one was there. I went back to bed, and the knocking began again, and the windows fogged up, on the outside. I hid under the covers for the rest of the night. Years later, when I got married, my husband and I moved to a two-story duplex. Things began happening there, too. The first time was after the birth of our daughter. When my stepson went to make a bottle for the baby, the bottles, which were always on the kitchen counter, were mysteriously gone. Then they reappeared a day later on top of the washing machine. On another occasion, while sitting on the couch one evening, I noticed flashing lights under the door that led to the garage. I went to investigate and found the hazard lights were blinking on my husband's truck. The funny thing is, the hazard lights never worked on that truck before. And when I went to turn them off, I found that the door to the truck was locked, which was highly unusual, because my husband never locked the truck when it was in the garage. When I became pregnant for the second time, the ghostly happenings increased dramatically. I began to smell aftershave, smoke, and toast in the middle of the night, and I got mental images of people that I didn't know when I smelled them. Later on, I found out from a neighbor that the man who once owned the property had evidently stuck around after his death, too. I'm sure that there were other spirits in that house as well, and some not so nice. On a few occasions, I would smell the odor of rotting meat, after doing a little bit of research on that phenomenon, I learned that these odors can be created by evil spirits. That scared me. So we sold up and left.
Between the ages of 12 and 17, I lived in what I believe was a haunted house. I never had experiences like that before or after living in that house. Once as I was hanging up clothes in my closet, I heard someone whisper my name in my ear, clear as day. I never sprinted out of a room so fast in my life. Another time, my sister and I had some friends over, and we decided to use a tape recorder to ask questions of the ghosts, like they do on those ghost hunting TV shows. We played the tape back, not expecting to hear anything, but we could hear a very soft voice say, I'm in the closet. And we were sitting right near a small closet in the basement at the time. My parents eventually decided to sell. We moved to a new place while the old place was still on the market. One evening, my sister went there after a few showings to make sure that things were clean and to lock up. She went down to turn off the lights in the basement. One switch was on the far end of the basement, away from the stairs. She turned off the lights and swears that she heard heavy footsteps of someone running towards her, but no one was there. She left without turning out the rest of the lights or locking the door. That was the last time either of us went back to that house, until we happened to be in the neighborhood one day and the new owners offered to show us the renovations. Nothing happened, but when the new owners asked us if we wanted to babysit for their kids one night, we politely declined.